So with that, I am going to um, introduce Francisco Mena. It's a great pleasure to introduce Francisco. I've known Francisco. I can't even remember how long I've known you, Francisco. <laughs> a long time. But uh, Francisco is an agronomist. He is a partner in a consulting company called Gamma that, has it, that focuses on both Grove Consulting and research and development with an, and they, their office headquarters is in Chile in um, Kyoto, and they focus on avocado and citrus production. Francisco studied at the Catholic University of Valparaiso, and he has a master's in citrus production from the Polytechnic University in Valencia, Spain. He's been involved in uh, avocado and citrus since 1997, first as a technical agronomist for an export company, and then as a, um, as a partner in Gama. And so with that, I will turn the presentation over to Francisco. So let me get off a of share. Can you, can you see the full screen? Yes. Okay, great. Thank, thank you, Mary Lou. Thank you, John. Thanks, Lorena, also for, for helping a lot in organizing the meeting. And good morning, everybody. Again, first of all, I would like to, to thank the organizers for inviting me to, to present today. Uh, I believe that the idea of uh, Avocado Cafe um, is a tremendous opportunity to enhance ex exchange of ideas and discussions so all of us can be part of a better industry. And one of the things that outstands avocado industry from others is the level of communication between different actors. And this space will only make it even more evident and helpful for all of us to exchange ideas and, and, and always have a better outcome for, for a whole industry. Just as a brief in introduction, uh, Gamma is a company that, as, as Marie-Lou mentioned, is focused on consulting and research in avocados and citrus. We are located in uh, Quillota in Chile, at the, where, where, the, where the avocado business started. And we usually are a common participant in, 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 in World Avocado Congresses and avocado brainstorming, uh, presenting uh, all most of the, of the research that we believe it's uh, useful for, for the industry. Uh, these days we consult around 20,000 acres of avocados and about 4,500 uh, acres of, of citrus. Uh, we run today more than 70 trials between citrus and avocados, and uh, they're mainly located close to our office, uh, which is uh, our office is in this area in the central part of Chile, and we run our trials between Cabildo and, and Santo Domingo in the coast. What's, what's the basis for, for the uh, avocados research and development that we, that we have? Basically, we, we try to pursue a direct impact on productivity, which means that, the, which is the final outcome per hectare. And that means that we are always trying to enhance production or work on a cost reduction or ease of management or improve of course harvesting the fruit because as, uh, as you know, we're an export market or an export producer. So most of our fruit has to travel for long periods of time. So we need to have a fruit that can, uh, manage well during that period of, uh, of transit. One of the most important things that we have done in the past years is that uh, several years ago, we met uh, Ruben Hofshi and he uh, sowed the idea between us of going to high density. And uh, we went to California to see what he was doing in high density. And uh, we moved it to, to Chile and since then, we've been working a lot in high density and how to manage and implement high density. And everything that we do today in Chile is mainly based in, or usually based on high density orchards. Our common planting uh, pattern these days is about seven and a half by seven and a half feet. So most of what we do is related to high density. And, and I would say that uh, Ruben was the person responsible for sowing that seed in our minds and uh, for making us uh, go another step and, and, and apply the plant high density orchards. At some point when he came to Chile, he was able to see how many hectares we had on high density plantings and he just couldn't believe it how fast we had gone with, with high density. 
So uh, growing with high density and having a lot of hectares planted under this uh, uh, high density systems, much of our R&D at some point turned into high density. So for several years, we started uh, studying what were the best planting distances uh, for our conditions, the use of PGRs uh, to maintain our trees or to help uh, our trees producing under these high densities. Pruning under these uh, densities also uh, is changing. Nutrition was also, or has also been studied in, in, in this uh, planting patterns because it also changes. And we're also these days also trying alternatives to PGRs to manage uh, high density orchard. As you can see, this is what uh, most of our orchards look like today. Uh, very close trees planted together and uh, and and managed with uh, with uh, heavily pruning, not heavily, but he uh, pruning every year and and uh, focusing on uh, high producing trees. What is the main research in the past years? We've done pollination and pollinators together with uh, Mary Lou in the University and the Hofstra Foundation, high density and PGRs, pruning timing, nutrition, irrigation. Today, we we're working a lot with biostimulants for root growth and fruit production. Uh, we've also been studying uh, different ways to manage salinity, including reverse osmosis. Uh, these days, we're also working, and I'll show you later on uh, what we've done on uh, temperature stress management. And we've also been working or did work a couple of years ago in pre and post harvest conditions influencing the appearance of a black spot on the fruit. As I mentioned, many of the things that we do are the most more interesting ones. Uh, we usually uh, publish them in the World Avocado Congress. And for example, this is one of that we published together with, uh, with Mary Lou and uh, the Congress in Peru. As of what we have these days, you, you can see there's there's a big switch. Today we have four out of 43 trials, about 50% of them, 19 of them, uh, has to do with soil biostimulants. We also have trials on nutrition, solar protectors, pruning, and, and, and other things. But but you can see how how things have switched. And as I for many years we did try or uh, work a lot on PGRs. These days we're working on uh, systems to, to stimulate uh, the trees and the root growth, mainly applied through, through the soil. One, one of the most encouraging things for us these days is that we work in an industry that uh, has grown a lot in the past years. You can see, for example, here, the amount of uh, the million pounds imported by the UK market in the past 10 years. And you can see how, how it has increased by 3.2 fold. The same if we take a look at what happens with, uh, with the US, uh, where you can see that the imports in the past 10 years have also increased by 3.4 fold. So that means that consumption has been increasing year by year. And that means that we work in an industry that has still a lot of room to grow. If we look at the per capita consumption in main destinations, you can see that California has the highest consumption you know, from the compared areas with 17.3 uh, pounds per capita. And if you go to countries like South Korea or China or Russia, consumption is very low. So if at some point we are able to bring these countries up to the consumption that uh, California has, that means that we are able to grow a lot uh, with uh, the fruit that we might produce in the future. So that, that leaves us room to grow uh, for the future. Even if we look what's happening in Latin America, uh, where probably someone can say, you know what, uh, countries like Latin American countries with lower income, they are not able to import avocados that much, but usually they do and, and, and imports have been increasing in the past years. And here you can see how from 2004 until this year, imports of avocado have increased in, in Latin America. Even, even in Chile, it's amazing what has happened. What if we take a look of what's happened between 2010 and 2021, um, we changed from being a 100% export country to an importing country. In the year 2020 and to, or 2021, production was very low and that might have enhanced imports, but nevertheless, there is an import trend of importing, uh, of importing avocados due to an increasing consumption and to a seasonal shortage of local avocados that has been supplied mostly by Peru and in some years also by Mexico and the US. 
But uh, there are also some clouds up in the sky. There's some people that for some reason want to attack the avocado consumption based on misinformation. Uh, I think that uh, we all know that studies have shown that avocados are not only CO2 positive, which means that they capture more CO2 than the one needed for the production, but they also help build soil and create a better environment for vegetation that surrounds avocado orchards. We're very sure we work in a very sustainable industry and we know that's a fact. Um, why are people that still don't get it? Why is our information not getting to them and who's competing with us uh, so that we have this uh, 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 newspapers like The Guardian posting things like that, that there are people that don't want to eat more avocados. I think that the world avocado industry, and I think it's doing it and we have to do it more. Uh, we should work together as one to show the world how sustainable we are and that we produce one of the healthiest products. Uh, so uh, that's something that we need to encourage in the, in, in the future and, and, and defend our, our avocados from this sort of attacks. If, if we look at what happens in the soil when in, in our avocado orchards, we can see that below this layer of uh, fallen leaves, we have a huge amount of roots, but also a huge amount of fungus that develops there. We have a high level of organic matter that allows uh, life of uh, earthworms or different insects that you can see here. Uh, but not only uh, there's uh, insects or microlife that we can see in the orchards, they're also full of uh, wildlife like uh, foxes or eagles. And you can see this one is carrying an avocado. So they, they're not also visiting the orchards, they're also feeding from the avocados. You can see now how, how it's landing and, and how the avocado is and it's carrying the avocado. Uh, there are also different sort of uh, birds in the avocado orchards. Uh, we're also beekeepers. We have to take care of the bees because we, we our business survives because of bees. And, and that's something that we probably have to tell the world. Uh, we not only have the bees in the orchards, but for example, we have many growers that grow uh, flowers like lavender to feed the bees as an alternate source of uh, food uh, for, for, for them to forage. Uh, we can also see in this lavender, we have some, uh, uh, birds such as hummingbirds and uh, you can see here a swan there's one another one there's a nest of hummingbirds this uh, picture was supplied by Mary Lou you see how they they are uh, nesting in, in avocado trees so uh, it's amazing how this industry is sustainable how life grows in our orchards and, and we're not only responsible, we're not only environmental, environmentally responsible and wildlife grows in our orchards, but also we, we, we take a lot of care of what we do. Uh, for example, we uh, use a lot of natural enemies against pests. And for example, you can see here how we grow uh, uh, the, in castor beans, there's a certain type of red mite that grows there that doesn't affect avocados. And we uh, move, uh, affected uh, leaves with this red mite from one castor bean to another so that they get attacked by this uh, mite and there the uh, natural enemies that uh, fight mites will grow and then we go to the castor bean trees we pick the natural enemies from there the stetorus or the oligotas and we uh, take them to the orchard so we don't have to do any sprays against red mites so the same with uh, uh, greenhouse trips we work a lot with uh, natural enemies, uh, which help us uh, fight against uh, greenhouse trips. And these days we're not spraying anymore against uh, greenhouse trips. So that means that we're able to uh, work in an industry that basically works without any use of uh, pesticides. The same with uh, white scales. Several years ago, when we started exporting to China, there was a big issue because we were having a lot of rejections because of the presence of white scales in the fruit. Uh, and there was, there was two ways to go. One was to use uh, pesticides, basically neonicotinoids that could be applied through the irrigation system. And the other one was to use natural enemies. Uh, we decided to go using natural enemies. And today we have growers that have their own labs where they grow the scales and then they grow the natural enemies. So they can, in case that they have any any presence of scales in the orchard, they, they take the natural enemies to the orchard and they will 
uh, control the scales with natural enemies and not with not using any any pesticides. The same issue happens when they talk that they say that avocados use a lot of water and that we don't care about irrigation or we that we use a lot of water. Uh, I think that we have to tell people that uh, we usually pump water up on the hills, and and I think California is similar to Chile, uh, in which electricity cost is quite high for pumping water up on the hill. So that means that we have to be very careful with the water usage, and uh, uh, we we are always taking care of the amount of water that we use. And usually, when they say, for example, like that article that I showed you with uh, the Guardian, they they are saying, you know what, we want to change. Uh, guacamole for, for some sort of guacamole done with beans. Uh, I'm not against beans, but beans use more than three times the amount of water per kilo than, than, than avocados do. So I think that we need, we need to, to, to uh, show uh, in, a, in, a, in a better way what, what our orchards mean and, and how healthy they are for, for the environment. And now, uh, if we go a little bit uh, to, to what I want to talk about today, other than giving an introduction, or probably that, that, that you maybe know about our industry, but uh, is what, what are the main factors affecting avocado production? And uh, if we take a big look at what, what, what affects from the, the big factors, we have climate, soil, and water. And um, just as any other crop, avocados need a combination of soil, climate, and water. And then when we talk about water, we talk about quality and availability to produce a commercially successful production. During the past decade, we have seen a change of variation in two of these conditions. We have had unusual weather conditions in some years, which also have been related in some cases to water uh, availability uh, as a vital resource to grow avocados. And not only availability, but also when availability shrinks down, usually at least in our case, we've seen in some areas that water quality is also suffering. When, when we take a look at what happens with climate or uh, we, we have to ask before, ask ourselves before if we think it's, it's the weather is changing, the climate is changing or is it part of a cycle? Uh, we've seen issues with heat, with frost, and at the end of the day, that means that our trees are under stress and we have to try to fight or control that. If we take a look at what's uh, believed that will happen in Chile uh, for the future, and this is what the actual situation is. This is what will happen in, supposedly, will happen in 2050, and this is 2070. Uh, we can see that uh, what they think, what studies show, this is a study from the University of Chile. It shows that maximum temperatures during the summer will raise, so we will have hotter summers. Um, they also show that during winter, our temperatures will also be, be higher, our minimum temperatures will, temperatures will increase. And that will be even, even worse by 2070. When we look at what happens with rainfall, there will also be a decrease which should affect more in the central part of Chile. Oops. Now I'm there, sorry. Uh, in, in this area will be the one that will suffer the most from this shortage of, of uh, rain. And that's where we grow most of our uh, avocados. But on the other hand, we will take a look at what will happen with uh, frost, and that's temperatures below 32 Fahrenheit. You can see that as, as weather changes, we will have less and less frost events, which means that there could be an opportunity for avocado growers to also look uh, in different and non-conventional production areas. This is, this is how the climate risk index uh, for avocados should evolve. And again, it shows new opportunities that will be created in the future for growing avocados. You can see here that the, the green is very low uh, in uh, risk index. And you see how it moves south and how probably in the future, our industry will be able to move uh, to the south. Probably in your case, it will be to the north. And, and also in our case, uh, 
it will mean that we can move to areas where we have better availability and quality of water. Uh, again, when we take a look at what happens uh, with the heat waves, and this is information from the Ministry of uh, Environment here in Chile, you can see on the left what's the current situation with the uh, days above uh, 86 uh, Fahrenheit, and what it will be between 2035 and 2065. And you can see that there's an area that will have a huge increase in uh, the number of days above uh, 86 Fahrenheit. This is how it will change. You can see that there are some areas that will have an increase about, about a month or something during the year that will have uh, temperatures. From the baseline they have today, they will have 30 or 35 days more during the year with uh, high temperatures. When we see what happens uh, in growing areas such as Peumo, and, and, and if we define that 91.4 Fahrenheit is the temperature in, at which, uh, that's the threshold in which avocados will, will close their, their stomata, uh, you can see that in, in 2018 and 2019, during September till March, in, in Peumo, we had nine days above that, th that threshold. Uh, but the year after that, we had 40, 42 days above the, the 91.4 Fahrenheit. And that happened in all production areas. And uh, 2000, 2020 was a very low cropping year for us. And we believe that all these heat waves were in some part responsible for a huge fruit drop that we had. And we, we, we were about... Uh, 40% of our usual crop. What happened the year after that? Uh, in 2020, 2021, we only had five days above uh, 91.4 Fahrenheit. And we are seeing that this season that we're picking right now is quite a normal season. So, so there's an issue with temperatures that uh, at some point we can wait 20 or 30 years to, to address. We, we can move the industry in, in, in a couple of years. So there are some things like temperatures, high temperature events that we need to address. Just as a brief explanation, what happens when, uh, when, when temperature goes up, and this is, uh, let's say a generic tree, it's pretty generic, looks like a citrus, but grows uh, fruit that looks like apples. Uh, when, when, when temperatures are normal, what this tree will do is that it will take water from the soil and take it all the way up to the leaves and from then on, it will be transformed to steam and moved into the atmosphere. And through this process, the tree will maintain his temperature. So at the same time, uh, and through the, the same pore or stomata where, where, where water goes out, uh, through a process that uses sunlight, at, which is called basically that's photosynthesis, the tree will transform CO2 into carbohydrates to feed the plant, and it will liberate O2 into the atmosphere for, for us to breathe. And then uh, whatever the tree uh, produces photosynthates, it will go down into other areas such as shoot development, fruit growth, root growth, and, and other parts of the tree. And, and the question is what happens when the temperature goes up, up to this certain threshold, uh, what happens to the tree? And what will happen is that it will not close stomata by 100%, by but it will close it uh, quite a bit. And it will lose a lot less water. So that means that you will bring in a lot less CO2. So it will be able to produce a lot, of, a lot less carbohydrates. And that means that there will be a shortage of carbohydrates that will have uh, different effects on, on the tree. For example, uh, if we combine during flowering uh, a high temperature event with low uh, relative humidity and avocado pollen has a very thin out layer, uh, outer layer, uh, that means that that pollen might dehydrate. And uh, we can see that uh, those years when we have very low humidity levels during flowering, we have a lot of cubes and we have no pollination. Um, 
if, if it happens uh, later in the season, we can have big amounts of fruit drop uh, because of a shortage of carbohydrates, but it also can affect fruit size. So you have on the left side, fruit that's probably been produced under normal photosynthesis conditions. And in the right side, you have fruit that's been produced under shortage of carbohydrates. So uh, these days uh, we are able to measure the con stomatal conductance and we've been trying different things. And stomatal conductance, that means that what's the gas exchange between the plant and the environment? And, and that means how, how is the photosynthesis uh, rate in the plant as an indirect measure uh, can be measured with this instrument. And here, for example, you can see this was measured this year in February. What happens with uh, stomatal conductance, which is the green uh, line, as temperature raises. And you can see how as temperature raises, stomatal conductance drops uh, by a high percentage. And that means that the tree, when it reaches certain level of temperature, the photosynthetic capacity and the, avail the ability of the tree to feed himself with carbohydrate decreases. And uh, the question is, okay, if, if we have this issue with temperature and the tree is not producing the amount of carbohydrates that it's supposed to produce, what do we do? Do, do we net our orchards so that we don't have that level of temperature to, so we can protect our trees? What happens, for example, if we net our orchards, what happens with pollination? That's something that we might need to ask ourselves. Or we put uh, overhead sprinklers to uh, start the irrigation when we have uh, heat waves so we can drop temperature with, uh, with our irrigation systems. And then the question will be, okay, will it affect our water footprint? Uh, do we have enough water to, to do this, uh, this treatment? So, there's another one that we need to solve. The other one is uh, let's use uh, screen protectors or, or sun protectors. And then the question is, okay, if they work, how do we spray them on, 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 on the farms when we have the, the, the orchards up on the hills? So there are, there are, there are solutions on, in, in, in that we can uh, look for, but we need to measure all different uh, aspects of, um, of what, they, what they mean. Here, here we have a graph that shows what's happened with the leaf temperature and the ambient temperature. And you can see that at certain time of the day, leaf temperature will go above ambient temperature. And probably that's the time when stomata start closing and the leaf starts gaining temperature. When we see what happens with different treatments for controlling stress, here you have one of the products, and, and that's the one that I showed in the picture that uh, stains the trees white. Uh, and you can see that temperature goes even though, even a little bit higher than the, than the control, but uh, we'll see what happens later with uh, stomatal conductance. And these are all other treatments in which you can see that in most of the treatments, temper leaf temperature, is lower than, than the control. Even, even with this one that's been, uh, that was soil applied, which is very interesting because it solves uh, many of, uh, of, of the difficulties we have when we're working up on the hills. So what happened with uh, stomatal conductance? Basically what happened is that you can see here in red, that's the control. Stomatal conductance in the control was the lowest. And all the treatments that, that we did uh, well, this is an ongoing research, so that's why we still don't have the names. We're, we're, we're still uh, need to get uh, production results, but we see that trees are more are able to uh, have a higher photosynthesis. So we should expect in the future to have a higher rate uh, or a higher production. But when when we have heat waves, and 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 and, and probably in the in the next year or so, we should have some information regarding what happens with production. We also should be looking what happens with our fruit when we have these heat waves. And um, we were talking with Mary Lou, and as I was, uh, I will show you some some issues, some pictures. And, and and there's a research that was conducted about 20 years ago in, uh, in the Californian industry by Mary Lou, and, and and the results that we have these days are pretty similar. 
but they will be probably worse if we have more consistent uh, days with high temperatures. This is a, a picture of fruit that was harvested uh, in a bin. And you can see that we removed some of the fruit from this area in order to see what will happen with, with temperature. It's not that we have a bad camera. The thing is that this picture was taken with a thermal camera and, and you will see what happens. Uh, if we put the thermal filter, this is what it will show. You can see where we remove the fruit on top, the temperature from the second or third layer was a lot cooler than the one on top of the bin. And you can see that uh, at some point we have fruit that was about 77 degrees Fahrenheit and other fruits that were around 102 uh, degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So uh, that means that there will be a difference in post-harvest behavior between the fruits from the upper part and the lower part. Also, when we move the bins, we see that uh, bins without any protection, I'll talk about protection a little bit later, uh, the fruit moves a lot more than when we have the bins with the protection. So we're using these lids up on top of the bins. That helps us protect the fruit from direct uh, suns of, of the sun while they're waiting to be taken to the warehouse and the farm. Uh, and uh, when comparing with lids and without lids, we can see that there's a lot less lenticel damage uh, when we're protecting the fruit. But also, not only that, also uh, weight loss when we put lids on the bin is a lot lower. And you can see that when the bins are not protected, we lose about four or five percent of the weight due to dehydration uh, when we get to the packing house. So, so that's a big amount of money that we're losing by uh, dehydration if we're not protecting the bins. The other issue that we have to be concerned for the future is water. And uh, we have to be concerned about availability, quality, and also uh, related to uh, heat conditions, what's the irrigation methodology are we using? And at some point, if we had a high temperature during summer, we might use uh, a daily irrigation schedule just to uh, maintain uh, moisture on the top inches of, of the soil. What we have seen is that with a reduction in snow availability, uh, the, there is an increase in chloride uh, content in the irrigation water in, in most of the valleys. This is usually what we see during winters when we have a normal amount of snowpack. Uh, this is what we have seen last year with a very snow, uh, very low snowfall. This is what we were able to see between July 2020 and July 2021. You can see how uh, in 2020, we had a lot more snow than in 2021. And not only that, you can see that the valleys were a lot greener than they, they were this year. Uh, for us, we had a, a heavy snowfall in, in August, which uh, help us maintain uh, a better snowpack for, for this time of the year. So we have a, a little bit more water than we were, were expecting for, for the summer. In our case, most of, most of our rootstocks are Mexican race, which means they're very sensitive to chlorides. That's a 38 parts per million. And when you look at the numbers that uh, were published by Emil Hav in 2003 or by Oster and Arpaio in 2007, 2007 there's, there's, a, there's uh, 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 a common conclusion that about 12% of potential production uh, is lost by every 35.5 parts per million or one milli equivalent of chlorides uh, and increasing water production. So that means that if we have a potential production of 13.5 thousand uh, pounds per acre when we have uh, a water of 38 part per million, parts per million, with an increase, we can go all the way down to 6.2 thousand pounds per acre if our chloride level is at 250 parts per million. And what have we seen in Chile in the past years? That uh, in different areas, this is Pelmo, and you can see from 2009 and all the way to 2021, chloride content has increased and has sustained, uh, it has been always above the 38 parts per million threshold. That's the trend. 
And uh, when we go to Mayarauco, which uh, irrigates with water from the Mapocho Valley, which comes from Santiago, you can see what's the EC of the water. You can see that's the threshold of 0.75, and you can see how it is climbing up in the past years. Uh, this was, a, we had a better snowfall, so EC went down, but then in the summer, it was really, really bad again. Again, the trend is that uh, EC uh, is going up, so that means that our trees are under a lot more stress. This is what happens with chlorides. You can see that uh, in many occasions, we've been above 200 parts per million and even all the way up to 250. Even this year, we went all the way up to 400 in some areas. Uh, it was really bad this summer. So the question is, what can we do with that? Some growers, the ones who have been able to, they put uh, reverse osmosis plants, but uh, not everyone has the, the financial uh, capability to do that or the way to solve what to do with whatever comes out from the plant. So not, not all the growers can do that. So one of the things that we have tried is we have tried a weed extract uh, that's supposed to help control um, stress conditions in, in, in different sort of uh, trees. This is Kelpak, it's a South African product. We have tried uh, four different rates, anywhere from 1.6 to 3.2 gallons per acre, put uh, in springtime or springtime and summer, which would, in our case will be November and March. And uh, after a four year period, we can see that there's an increase in fruit numbers, anywhere from 23 to 53%, which is uh, heavy for those areas because they, they really struggle to get uh, to, to numbers where they are profitable. When we look at what happens with the crop per tree, and this is the pounds per tree that we harvest uh, in four years, you can see again that there's an increase anywhere from 18 to 48% in production uh, between the different treatments. So this treatment has helped us getting along with salinity. It will probably not solve all the problems, but it will at least help us get to productions where uh, growers can make some, some profit out of the, out of the uh, avocados. And not only we have more kilos, but also we have more kilos of fruit that's bigger. Here you can see this table shows the amount of kilos per treatment out of four years uh, in different uh, sizes. And you can see that the T4, which was 3.2 and 3.2 gallons per acre in November and March, has the highest production of fruit above size 48s. And uh, not only we have better fruit size, but uh, what explains that we've been having better production. One thing is that we've been having, we see that the trees are flowering better. Sometimes when we have uh, heavy salinity conditions uh, in our orchards, we see that the trees don't flower as well. And you can see here that the trees of the control had very low flowering, 3.6% of the canopy covered uh, with flowers, whereas the best treatment had uh, almost 37, no, 36% of the canopy covered with flowers, which is a lot more flowers and a lot more opportunities to set fruit for the, for the next year. When, when we look at what happened with uh, salinity damage, and this is percentage of the canopy covered with uh, leaves affected by salinity, you can see that all treatments look pretty much the same. The first year, this one was better. The second year also. The third year, it was also better than the rest of the treatments, but uh, the, the last year it had a little bit higher salinity damage. But one thing that we, we, we see is that year by year, the amount of salinity increases in the different treatments. Uh, one thing that we have to take into consideration is that as trees produce more fruit, they will use more water. This is tomato conductance and, and uh, the amount of fruit that a tree produces. And you can see that the higher the fruit load, the higher the tomato conductance. So that means that they use more water. So if trees use more water, they will bring more salts in. So usually what we should see is that if a tree produces more, more water, as it brings more salt, more water will bring more salts in and will should have more damage. But if we index the, the salinity um, uh, 
graph that I showed you and standardized it by production, you can see that the treatment, which was here, the 3.2 and 3.2 gallons per acre, was the one that had the lowest index of salinity related to the amount of kilos produced. So that means that there's a there's probably a lower level of damage when we treat with this product. The problem is that as there is more fruit, it might show similar uh, salinity conditions to the control, but uh, under normal conditions, it should show more salinity damage because of having more fruit. So just to summarize, uh, and this has been real quick, conditions are changing and we need to adapt. Ambient conditions are more prone to stress. There are several issues we need to focus in, uh, which are how to prevent temperatures that will cause stress. Do we net the trees? Do we spray water? Do we use sun protectants? And then how do, what do we do to reduce salinity effects of productivity? Do we use reverse osmosis, root stimulators? Uh, how do we apply these products? What side effects will there be if we cover the trees with uh, some uh, white, shield as I showed in the picture, will we have more mites? There, there are several things that uh, we need to, to see and we need to understand them in order to know what to look for in the orchards and adjust management as conditions change. So I would really encourage you to stay tuned to Avocado Cafe because the idea of this meeting is to bring people in to open up this sort of discussions to, 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 to talk about these things because we need to know what to look for uh, as uh, we are managing our orchards. And at some point, if we see things are changing, be able to have an open forum with different people, good specialists coming in and be able to discuss about that as we see that things are happening. And just to finish, I would just uh, would like to thank a group of growers that helps us uh, finance most of the research that we do in, in avocados and citrus and to the team at uh, Gamma that uh, does all the, all the research that uh, we usually show at the Congress and in several sort of meetings. So thank you very much. And uh, if there are any questions, we should start the discussion. <laughs>